Should we start? Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. This is a, a, a webinar where we'll be talking about uh, the monitoring and impacts of marine litter with some uh, focus on plastics, both macro and microplastics. We know this is, uh, well, the, the plastics and the marine litter is not a new issue, but we've been discovering uh, a lot about the micro and nanoplastics and the effects that this has on biodiversity. And also we are trying to get standardize as we do for biodiversity and we've been talking in, in these seminars a lot of uh, observing and monitoring biodiversity but we are also trying to standardize and improve the ways that we uh, use to um, uh, detect and monitor also the different the different types of uh, marine litter and uh, of, of plastics uh, and so we will be uh, hopefully talking a bit on how maybe in some uh, in some instance is possible to code to uh, to develop methods to co-monitor biodiversity and this marine litter so this uh, webinar was organized uh, in is a joint organization between the air center networking fridays that many of you are probably familiar with and with the MVON Biodiversity Networking Fridays that we've been organizing once a month, with the Maelstrom, a project that is uh, that is going to be introduced by its coordinator a bit later, uh, Fantina here present, that is dealing with the different aspects of the uh, plastic problem from uh, um, uh, having uh, increasing awareness of what we should do to avoid plastic and other marine litter, to taking out what exists, what is already there in the ocean and rivers, to how to reuse it and, and so on. Okay, and so um, our program will consist, uh, as you know, you have it there as a set of, uh, of talks and then we'll have a round table one so all your questions you can uh, put them in the chat they will be followed and they will be answered uh, when we have then the, the round table so it is my pleasure now to introduce our first and our keynote speaker that i think uh, most of you probably know, uh, he's a very, very well-known person and uh, an expert, uh, Professor Mike Elliott, that we used to know, uh, of course, as uh, part, as a, as a director of the, <clears throat> of the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Hull, but, uh, and former director of the Institute of Estuarine and Coastal Studies. Uh, now, he, uh, continues very active, although he's the emeritus professor, but he's director of international history and coastal specialists. Uh, so he's more now on the consultancy, continue to work as always in, in this uh, same uh, subjects. So he's a marine biologist, but has a really a wide experience and interest um, in the advisory consul and consultancy uh, on all these issues of history and marine ecology, policy, governance, and, uh, and uh, of course, management, that's uh, in the end what we need. So please, Mike, we are all very uh, waiting, very anxious for your, your presentation. Thank you very much <clears throat> for being here. Th thank you, Isabel. And it's, it's it's great to see um, you, you on online. We've known each other for a long time, and uh, it would be even better to see you in person. But uh, that that will be next time. Um, and, and greetings to um, uh, friends and colleagues that I I, I know online. Uh, thanks, thanks, Isabel, for those those kind words. Um, yes, as Isabel mentions, I'm I'm now an emeritus professor at the University of Hull in the UK, uh, but um, spend more time. 
uh, running uh, IX Limited, the International Estuarine and Coastal Specialists, which is a, a, a research uh, organization, a research institute. <clears throat> So what, what I want to do is um, uh, introduce the, the overall subject um, and then try and lead us into some of the talks that come later. Uh, some of the things, I, I realize some of the people online are experts in the field and some are rather newer to the field. So I'll, I, I want to move through the, uh, through the slides uh, fairly quickly, uh, but you, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you will be able to get the slides later anyway. And uh, if you need any of the diagrams, then please uh, feel free to, to use them. So, so litter, as you see, we're, we're all producing it. Some people produce more than others, but we're all producing it there. We are um, sort of um, familiar with the background to it. We know it's a problem. We know it's a marine problem. Although we, regard, we, we discuss it as a marine problem, but actually most of it, as you'll see, is a land problem. Um, most of it comes from the land. There is some that comes from the sea, but most of it is, is a land problem. So what, what we, we, we then need to do is think about why it's such a problem. And as, in, as with many of the things we do, we think about the, the cause, the consequences, and the solutions, this, this cause, consequence, response chain. Uh, and of course, in, in tackling any subjects, it's good to start with a definition that um, says what uh, what it is. And this is the definition that uh, it, the uh, DG environment use. And, and I think you're all familiar with that. Now, a little while ago, Uncle Borker and I, um, Uncle from um, Asti in, in northern Spain, um, we started looking at the way different pollutants had been published, the papers that we've got. And you'll see many of these aspects there. We've had the papers for, for a long time. Um, and, and say if um, this, this, this paper is published, but if you can't get hold of a copy, let me know. But it's these new emerging topics that we started looking at. We wanted to look at the publications in relation to um, human uh, interest or, or societal interest, uh, and and you'll see the, um, uh, the 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 yellow line at the bottom here, where for decades we didn't do anything with them, but 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 now you can see that the um, uh, the, uh, the the numbers of papers are increasing, and and, and this was just a standardised analysis we did. We published uh, 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 another um, paper with um, Lucia, uh, Lucia Fanini on um, what types of papers were published on litter. And again, you see the overall pattern here with, with increase. So we know we've got lots and lots of information now on these. But when you look at, the, and th this was a, a, a recent paper uh, as well, when you look at these papers, what we find is most of them are on the presence of litter and microplastics. And what I want to talk about is this dichotomy between papers on the presence of litter and, and microplastics and those that now are moving towards the, let's call it the so what question. OK, you tell me there's, there's litter there. So what? What do I do about it? What are the effects of it and especially the biological effects and we can look at the biological effects in terms of the effects on the natural system but also on us I mean we're a biological organism there so I, I'm, I'm not going to go through this whole scheme but what this scheme tells you is that um, is, is why we've got plastics in the environment and that's because we have drivers, our basic human needs, and we carry out activities and those activities lead to, to pollutants. And if we're not careful, they lead to pressures which degrade the natural system here and they degrade the, the, the human system. So we do something about it. We bring in restoration and maintenance and eco-engineering and all these things. So that's it. there's a lot in this diagram. That's very quickly um, what, what happens. So what we're trying to do is protect this ecological part of the system and deliver what society wants. And we've been for a while now, we've been doing that under a, a, a cause consequence response framework. It's now called DAPSI worm. It used to be called DIPSIA. 
And, and in essence, this is looking at what does society want from the system? What activities do we have? What pressures come from this, as in um, mechanisms of change, changes on the natural system, changes on the human system, and then we add responses in. And there's been a lot published on this, and this, this model is now being used by a, a, a lot of countries there. So what we need to do is put plastics within that framework. As it says within the DAPS UN framework, we have a lot of activities and these give rise to a lot of pressures. Now I'm not gonna go through it, but many of these activities will produce litter in one way or another and, and microplastics. And those producing those gives us these pressures, which are the mechanisms of change. So let's let's look at the the the, um, uh, the the basis of this. We see litter everywhere, like these disused lobster pots, disused long line fishing hooks, and disused um, uh, nets. We also see that this is a, a, a dredger that's you know, dredging a harbour, and and you can see here even dredging the harbour has brought up litter like these um, uh, th these cables. So when we add materials to the waters, to the sea, this is what we call contamination. Now we might call it pollution and we might talk about pollutants, but, but strictly speaking, we, it is contamination. That is, we are adding something to the water. We're not making any, when we talk about contamination, we're not making any judgment about whether it's going to have an adverse ecological response. All it is, is putting stuff into, um, in, in, into the sea. So then we have to separate that from pollution. That's why in, in the title I put pollution per se, the real meaning of pollution. So pollution per se is not only the introduction of those materials, um, but also the fact that it leads to harm. And, and, and we can use harm in a general term. So it harms living resources, it harms us with hazards, it stops us doing other activities and so on. So that's the distinction between contamination and, um, and pollution. I'm going to quickly talk about contamination and then get on to what I think is the most important topic. That is, okay, so what? We put the material out there, what does it do? Now we know that litter is everywhere now. We've got papers that go from the deepest parts of the ocean to the highest part of Everest, and, the, and there's litter there. We've got information on litter and microplastics in all environments. This happens to be, um, uh, this is a picture from, uh, Sandra Ramos has just produced um, a, 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 a review article that's going in the new treatise on estuarine and coastal um, uh, sciences, and uh, I've been working with Sandra from um, from CIMAR for a long time, and she's she's one of the co-authors of this this paper. So um, I thank to her for the material. So this is this is coral reefs, and we know there's litter there. We know there's litter in every habitat that there is. Um, so what about the size of it and what do we mean by this? And we can take the size of marine litter, everything from the um, plasticizers and colloids, which are really at the molecular level, through the microscopic and the macro scale and up to the mega scale and gigantic. And you see there we've got a, a, a typology of, of types of litter. There are other type, typologies of litter as well, but, but let's use this one there. Um, as Isabel mentioned just now, there's lots of work on microplastics just because they are so ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They, they come from all our activities and they, they, they go into all habitats. We now know that um, they, they come from places that we didn't expect them to come from. So, for example, um, this picture here, microplastic beads in toothpaste. I mean, who would have thought we were putting bits of plastic in our mouth when we when we brush our teeth? Um, we have microfibers every time we wash clothes, sort of billions of microfibers come off things. So we, we, we've, we've got the, the, the problem there. Now, just some background. I think many of you will know this. And Isabel asked about monitoring. 
Many of you will know that when we make plastics, we usually make them in this form. We make them as these little nodules, uh, what are called nurdles. I've no idea where the term nurdle comes from. It's not a common word in any language, but, but these are nurdles. So they're made, plastic is made in this form, so you can transport it easily. You can fill a tanker with these and you can blow them around. But because of this, they are easily lost. And I guarantee if you go near the, the beach, at, I was going to say, if you go near the beach at any port, you'll, you'll see this, nurdles on the strand line. And in fact, now um, there are nurdles in, in most beaches where people have looked, usually on the strand line. Isabel asked about coordinating monitoring. There are now um, exercises where people search beaches and record the number of nurdles. They, 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 um, they're light, they float, they move with the tides, they get deposited on beaches at the high water mark, they get taken up by fish, they get taken up by birds. Um, you know, uh, fish and birds think these are, these are fish eggs and will feed on them. So if you're looking for a simple, a simple and quick way of monitoring um, the, the, these in the, in the um, uh, environment, then just go to your nearest beach. We have to think about the different types of plastics because we, we're talking about plastics, but actually plastics are, there are hundreds of types of them. They all have a different characteristic. And so the fates and effects of those depend on the particular characteristics. Some may attract bacteria coverings, some may be inert, some may float, some may sink and so on there. And, and one of the problems is we know that they, they, they last a long time, they have a, a long half-life there. We know that they accumulate in large areas, these large uh, continent, uh, um, oceanic gyres, and, and we know the amounts of them. We get horrendous stories like this, and we know they're there. But the main point is, OK, so we know they're there, we know the system is contaminated, but, but what about pollution? What effects do they cause within this? And in, in order to look at the, the fate and effect of any materials we, we put in the sea, we need this amount of information. We need to know what the materials are, how they behave in the, in the sea, how they behave if they get taken up by organisms, what is the physics, chemistry and biological degradation and so on. We need to know all of those. We need to know the uh, temporal extent of these, how long they live in there, hence the half-life. And we need to know the spatial extent of them well, how far do they go. And now we know that you know, we have plastic ducts that were lost at sea on all, on all, all beaches and things. So we know where they go. So let's think about these in, um, in, in the terms of health, because, as I said, looking at pollution, that's what we're interested in. And it's quite interesting to look in, at health in the environment in the same terms we think about in, in, in medicine. When you go to the doctor, the doctor does a diagnosis, then gives you a prognosis of what may happen, gives you treatment and hopes you recover. Well, this is where we are with the environment at the moment. We carry out an assessment, we make predictions, hopefully we bring in remediation and we might get to talk about this later and try and prevent the system. So we need a good knowledge of the ecological system and then we need a good knowledge of the human system to say what is the fate and effects of these pollutants. And, and this was a paper we published uh, a while ago now, 10 years ago now, uh, on, that, on how we look at health, this term health. Now, when we come to plastics, we start looking at them in the same terms that we use for any of the pollutants. That is, if a pollutant goes into the organism, does it change cells? If it changes cells, does it change an organism? If it changes lots of that organism, does it change populations? If it changes lots of um, populations, does it change the community? And then finally, does it change the ecosystem? And this is where we are with plastics at the moment, needing to know what is this chain. Um, for, for many um, uh, aspects, we can I'll, I'll just go through these. We, we know for different pollutants, we know what the signal is like. We know what the 
um, how specific they are and so on. Um, sorry, and, and, and we know what the pollutants are doing. The biggest challenge is trying to detect an effect against what we call the background noise. So let's quickly talk about the impacts of microplastics. We're now at the stage of knowing, or we have studies now on many of these aspects here. The, uh, the way they affect an organism, uh, the way they affect food being taken by organisms, the way they can carry pollutants, um, the way they can affect competition in the sea and so on. So let, let's, let's quickly just, just, just mention these. Um, uh, this, this paper was published a couple of years ago, uh, and, and Sandra uh, discusses this in, in, in the review that she's just written um, for, for the treatise, for the second edition of the treatise. And it really shows the way plastics affect, affect plankton uh, processes. A paper we did, Sandra and I did recently with our postgraduate student, um, uh, Sabrina Rodriguez, um, where we were looking at all of these types of effects on plankton, on phytoplankton, zooplankton, and ichthyoplankton, all of these types of effect. And if you look at these, this shows where we're moving from, not just the presence of plastics there, but actually the biological effects that make them pollutants. And, you, and you'll see these studies here. Uh, and I say the um, uh, paper that Sabrina led um, goes into details. So now we've got some information on transfer of plastics between systems. And I, I shan't go into too much on this because some of the other talks uh, later, such as Mariana's, we'll, we'll talk about some of these. But, but we are now starting to pick up things in, in, in food chains. Um, for a long time now, we've been looking at the effects of pollutants on fish. And this is quite a complex diagram. But what it shows is um, trying to get good ideas of when pollutants go into an organism, these xenobiotics, these alien, uh, or, uh, alien materials, whether they go in and affect the organism externally or internally. And then as you follow through this, this uh, horrendogram, you'll see that it, it affects you know, the physiology, the biochemistry, uh, the growth, the production, um, and then up to um, uh, sort of the amount of fish we can take. Now, the stage we're at with pl plastics and microplastics is we're only just starting to get a handle on this. We've got this for metals and oils, but for plastics, we're only just getting there. There's a lot of good anecdotal evidence now on the way plastics affect the higher, uh, the, the higher organisms, the sea mammals, the, uh, the turtles and, and, and the birds and so on. And so we're, we're needing to, these, these are the, 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 the photographs that get the, the politicians interested in this. Um, and, and you have things like these animals will die if, if, if we don't do something about it. Uh, this seal was seen by one of my students and um, they, they were able to cut the rope off and then the seal did recover. Right there. Right. And we can talk about these cycles. It's a very simple cycle showing the way we have plastic bags going into the sea. They degrade, they form microplastics, they get taken up by the food chain and eventually we take them up as well. And, and there are papers on this and on marine mussels and so on. So we are now, um, we're taking these in and in many cases we excrete them, but there may be some that we, we, um, uh, we do retain. So the, the main question for plastics research is what we call risk assessment and risk management. Can we assess the risk of these? Where are the problems coming from? And can we manage that risk? And, and I haven't got time to talk about it now, but there's, there's lots of work and we, we've done lots of work on risk assessment and we have a risk and hazard typology and so on. But, but these are the main questions. Now, in that risk management, it's saying, how do we solve some of these problems? What governance framework is there? And for a while now, we've been uh, talk, using something called the 10 tenets. A tenet is a sort of soft law. It's saying, can we bring in management solutions that fulfill all, the, all of these things? So 
Can our solutions to litter be ecologically sustainable? Well, they can be if we can remove them. Do we have the techniques and the technologies to remove litter? Is it economically viable to remove it? No, it, it costs a lot of money. Now we've got these large ocean gyres. And in particular, what does society want? What does, does society want us to spend money removing litter? Um, or do they, does society just tolerate litter there? No. And then the remaining 10, um, what about the ethics of it? So I'm sure society doesn't want to leave debris and it, it might in some cases think about future generations, but there are societies that don't think about litter. No, they are quite happy to just throw their rubbish into the nearest body of water. What, what about the um, uh, cultural aspects? No, what, how do people behave? What about the legislation, the legal side? Are there laws in our countries banning uh, plastics? And there are more and more now. And what about the administrative aspects? Do we have um, agencies that can control the way we use um, uh, and, and abuse litter? Um, uh, Organisations that go out and enforce if we are doing something wrong, like spreading our litter. And therefore, can we communicate this to people? And that's that's the great value of webinars like this. We are communicating. The unfortunate thing is we're probably communicating to people who are aware of this when, in fact, we need to communicate to people who are not aware of it. And politically expedient. What do the politicians want? Do the politicians lead and tell us what we should do or do they just wait for us to do something? There are solutions to, um, uh, to, to the, the, the litter. There are ways of um, having alternatives on them. Um, the economics, the plastic bag tax. We have the EU directives. I'll mention this in a minute. We have alternative uses. This is a, a, a new road surface made with, um, uh, with plastic beads. Um, these are fleeces made of recycled bottles. Can we do this? And then, uh, and, and um, Isabel um, uh, pushed on this, what does society want? But again, you see the paradoxes in this. So here we, we've made a fleece out of bottles. Great, we've used up some bottles for, for this. Uh, one recycled fleece contains eight plastic bottles. But every time that fleece is now washed, it releases the fibers that were in a nice controlled environment called a bottle and are now going into the sewage works and out into the sea there. Yeah. We have lots of legislation. Some of you have seen this before and I'm not going to go into it, but this is a horrendogram of all the marine legislation that we've had, that we have. Um, and I, I could go through each part and tell you how it relates to litter, um, but um, uh, let's just, just quickly mention two of these. In Europe, for those of you from Europe uh, and um, even those of us who now stupidly are outside the EU, but, um, but fortunately we still follow European directives. This is called the stupidity of Brexit, but um, that's what happens when you trust politicians to do, to do things. Um, those of you in Europe will know two large directives, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, that is based on a set of descriptors and the Maritime Spatial Planning Directive. And the whole idea is to get these two directives working together to protect the seas. And, and as you see of these, these Marine Strategy Framework Directive, it's got 11 descriptors of which one of them is litter. And each of these directives require us to have monitoring proposals. We have to have, or we have to carry out monitoring we need indicators, we need what are called programs of measures and so on. Moving from the European dimension to the global dimension, all of our countries, and I gather there's a, a lot of countries online, which is really great, it's, it's, it's excellent. Um, all of our countries have signed up to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Life below water is the one that we're focusing on for, for the sea. And what we, we then do is think about the targets and the indicators that we have within that. And if you look in SDG 14, uh, the first one 
has this target by 2025 to prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, in particular for land-based sources, including marine debris and nutrient pollution. And so we have an index of uh, plastic debris. Now, this by 2025, we are going to prevent, prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution. If we were all together in a room, I'd ask all of you to put your hands up if you think this is going to be achievable to prevent and significantly reduce it. And, and of course it's not. One of the things we did in this paper that Roland Cormier and I did, uh, we started looking, how good are these targets? Are they smart? Are they specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, or time bounded? And, and will we know when we've met these? Well, I'll, I'll mention to you now that I don't think we've got a, as we will say, a hope in hell of, of meeting that. So let, let's finish this there. And we can come back to discussion on this uh, uh, later. We know it's a huge problem. We know it's a diffuse problem. Point source pollution, we can tackle fairly easily. Diffuse problems such as this is very difficult. We need to think about pollution, not just contamination. Think about how many papers there are on contamination, and there's a lot less on pollution, but we're getting better than that. We know they occur in, in, in all environments on Earth, and indeed they occur in space now, because we've left our rubbish um, on the moon and uh, floating around us. The uh, litter reflects oceanographic processes. This is why when we lose a um, a, a, a container of plastic ducks in the uh, Pacific, they now travel around the world and those plastic yellow ducks uh, wash up on European um, shores. We know it's a case, as with much of pollution, what is called out of sight, out of mind, that throughout history we've dumped our waste into the nearest bit of water and hope that it gets taken away. But in this case, it doesn't get taken away, it stays there. We know we need solutions that go all the way from source, our behavior, to the sink, uh, the gyres. We know that monitoring isn't a solution. Monitoring is not a management um, uh, action. It's only a way of seeing if the solution works. We carry out monitoring to tell us whether our other actions are working or not. Um, uh, monitoring is only a solution if, as we monitor the litter, we collect it at the same time and remove it. Then we're making a, a, a minute amount of difference. Cleaning up, there are, uh, Isabel talked about cleanups and, and um, we, we can probably talk later about citizen science. There are some very long standing citizen science um, or, or, or citizen, citizen action cleanups. Uh, in the UK, we've been having a beach clean for about the last 30 years. And, um, and you say, do they do any good? Are they psychological or are they real? Because even if you have a lot of people, you can only clean a small amount of beach. It's high profile for regulators. They now are aware of it, but it might be low profile amongst the public. And the solutions have to cover those 10 things that I mentioned, especially human behavior. So we're now, uh, there's, there's the, um, uh, I think a, probably a biblical saying that you reap what you sow, and we're now we're doing this. We've been putting this litter into the sea. Well, some of it's now is, is coming back. So we, we need the solutions for it. Um, and the solutions go from um, stopping it going there to start with, uh, to cleaning up it afterwards. Now I, I can teach my grandsons to, not put litter into the sea, which they and they don't. Um, but I, I, there are countries in the world which produce a lot more than than, than we do. So I, I hope that's been <clears throat> been interesting as prevent provoked some questions that we can come back to later. But um, as I say, you'll you can all get access to this presentation, and if you if you want any more information, then just email me. Okay, thanks, Isabel. Well, thank you very much. This was a really, really very clear, very substantial uh, presentation. I think even if there were people in the room that uh, did not know much about 
um, marine plastic, especially these some of these aspects, were are now much more knowledgeable. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank we'll, you as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll have this roundtable discussion uh, after the, the, the next panel, and I hope you'll have lots of questions. Anyway, um, thank you, and I will we'll, uh, start now this panel. I would like to say that the, this whole event, so questions, answers, and, and uh, presentations, but also the discussion, will also contribute to uh, a key deliverable that we would like that we are um, um, uh, developing in Maelstrom. Uh, dedicate to best practice of marine, uh, of marine litter, especially, of course, this is especially um, dedicated to removal and valorization, but also the whole cycle. And this will be published in the European Environmental Agency database on marine litter. But anyway, I would like just to introduce now the moderator for the next session, and this is Luis Veda that we see here, and he's a, a researcher from CIMAR, and actually he was the main organizer of this session. Uh, uh, you may have, have seen the, 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 the presenters that you received mails from him. Um, and he's a, a researcher in CIMAR, and he's working a lot on ecology, but also in ecotoxicology. So really on uh, different kinds of pollutants and contaminants, we now uh, see the difference, uh, but also on the impacts. And he has uh, worked also in uh, a sector and he's working for work Really, help um, the pollution and the pollution uh, as a as the main. So I have him now, and he will take uh, part of the, of the webinar. Luis. Thank you, Isabel, for introduction and the both kind words also. I also take the opportunity to thank all the speakers for kindly accepting the invitation to be part of this Ocean Decade webinar and also to greet all online, worldwide participants. So after this uh, very interesting, and I should say inspiring keynote by Mike Elliott, it's time to start the session. And this session will be dedicated to marine litter co-detection impacts and uh, at several levels in the food web and also in the new solutions approaches to tackle this problem. And in fact, this is the aim, this is the mission of a very interesting project, the European project Maelstrom, that will be here presented by the scientific coordinator. Welcome, Fantina. Fantina is also a researcher in the National Research Council, Institute of Marine Science in Italy, and she developed also research on applied geophysics and underwater acoustics with a special focus on seafloor mapping and the passive acoustics. So, thank you, Fantina. The thank floor you, Luis. is uh, yours. Thank you for the invitation. I will also thank uh, everybody for the organizing this uh, webinar, also on behalf of the Maestrom project. Uh, really, thanks, thanks a lot for this, uh, and thank you for including me in, to the, in the speaker panels. Uh, I will share now my screen, hopefully I manage uh, Okay, just a second. Uh, Please let me know if you see, and uh, I will now also, okay, can you see? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, so I'm really happy to be able to present um, this project in this uh, uh, in this context because we have seen how big the problem uh, with Marie Litter is in, in the different in different um, 
aspects and here we want to uh, present you some you, you know some technological and not only technological solutions to try to tackle this problem because of course we need to monitor it but we need also to do something to uh, improve our environment so the maelstrom project which is a european founded project uh, funded by the european union has five uh, main uh, objectives the first of all is to develop and uh, a new marine litter removal uh, technologies and assess their effectiveness in terms of uh, you know um, uh, economical but also of course uh, in environmental sustainability. Uh, this is what we care uh, mostly about. And, but also it, it, uh, it has as an objective to, to feed circular economy sustainability clustering with other, uh, with other projects and initiatives that uh, develops blue technologies to tackle these issues and of course engage society uh, in general to marine litter prevention, removal and circular economy. So the concept is uh, as uh, um, to, to answer some of the uh, questions that were posed uh, by uh, Mike Elliott's uh, talk is first of all, to develop assist, uh, systems and um, approaches to localize, to identify where the marilita is. This is the concept of Maelstrom. So to tackle the, the issue from different point of views, to characterize, so to assess the status of the environment, but then to develop new technologies, as I said, to remove the marilita from the environment. And then also we don't stop there because, of course, once you have to remove it, you need to do something with it. So we want to also we develop some technologies to sort it, and we explore all different different kind of possibilities to transform it into something else and to uh, put it again back to the market. So these are uh, the main uh, objectives. So first of all, the effectiveness impact of marine litter removal. Uh, first of all, we in the pilot areas, we have done an assessment of the sources because this is uh, what we have seen. Uh, there are different sources that contribute to the litter in, uh, in, the, marine, in the seas, in our oceans and waters. waters. And um, we have done it, of course, for, the, for our pilot studies that are in the, uh, close to the Porto region and and uh, in the Venice coastal area, so we have two pilot areas we, there. We try to really to identify the sources of marine litter and to do a, a full review on this, uh, relating, of course, with other works that have been done in Europe uh, concerning the sources in general of marine litter um, in, in, in Europe. And so the first assessment was uh, and um, was, uh, was done, and we have also what we did, uh, since we want to apply technologies that remove uh, litter from the seafloor, uh, we also uh, want to do, we did an environmental assessment before the implementation of these technologies. And this was done and we, and we have done this for the pilot areas. And uh, in the Maelstrom project, uh, we, as I said, we developed two main technologies to remove marine litter from the environment. From in, in our case, we are talking about coastal environments because this was the topic of our talk, uh, of our uh, call. And uh, we developed uh, two main um, technologies, the Maelstrom Seabed Clean platform. So a platform that really collects the litter from the seabed, which is, uh, which is really the most challenging, I would say, um, most challenging task to be to remove the litter from the environment we know that most of the litter uh, I mean, about 70% is as the estimate uh, ends up on the seafloor, but once it's in the seafloor, it's really, really very difficult to collect. And the other technology is uh, another uh, technology that will be employed in the Porto region. And this is a, a bubble barrier that prevents, so a barrier of bubbles that doesn't really uh, affect the environment in a negative way. And uh, it, it stops, it prevents the litter to reach the ocean in this case, it will be co-powered by uh, solar panels, also by floating solar panels. So uh, these two technologies are under development. One of them is already was already done. I mean, this is the design that you see. It was already done in the first because we are now in the middle of the project. We have already we are now two years uh, started the, since the start of the project. It has been already. Um, 
we have already the uh, you know the the patent uh, was was uh, achieved by our partner Technalia, and it was actually uh, realized in in in, in, in through in, in from design to reality. So it's a, it's a real it's a real thing that was tested in September last year and will be uh, tested again. Uh, I mean tested and, and uh, deployed uh, in this this summer again in the Venice uh, coastal area, in the Ven close to the city of Venice. You see here, if you want a link to see the video to uh, to see how the, the, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, uh, to see how the platform really works. It has a cable robot that uh, you see, it's a robot that collects with this uh, gripper, it collects the, the litter from the seafloor, but also we have a, a tube that aspires, I mean, small, uh, small items. So it's more thought, of course, for macro litter, but, uh, uh, um, in the in the in this area, um, so. However, as I said, what do we do with the with the litter once we have uh, once we have collected it? We need to feed the circular economy, and this is. Uh, so we need to feed it and to, to recycle it in, in different ways, uh, because uh, you know, we know that uh, marine litter is very dirty. It's very hard to handle. It normally ends up either in, uh, uh, in incinerators or in you know in uh, waste disposal, uh, in land uh, land disposal. So uh, what do we do with that? We actually are um, testing different technologies, uh, a sorting robot that separates uh, the the litter. Uh, in, in a, with an using artificial intelligence system. I will show you more about this. But also we want to really do whatever to, 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 to be able to, to um, use whatever we collect in somehow, somehow either re recycle it mechanically or even chemically when it's not uh, when it's not possible to do it mechanically. I will show you some examples. We were talking about um, the efforts to uh, you know to standardize monitor uh, monitoring uh, protocols and. Uh, and this is Maelstrom is trying to do its part by developing an, a specific app that to do all the beach monitoring specifically, where we uh, where we actually try to um, to standardize using all the uh, indications, of course, of the um, marine um, uh, marine. Um, uh, of uh, the indication that uh, the stanzas that are used uh, and uh, and the data are collected and um, they are really standardized and they can be shared in the Emonet chemistry portal the Emonet chemistry portal uh, is uh, okay, a european portal where you, the, you where all the data about uh, you know, different contaminants and and uh, different uh, variables are collected. Specifically, marine litter. There is a, a topic on this, but the point is really to to make it easier. Also, this uh, the monitoring really easy and, and standard. Um, an example of circular economy that we already uh, realized uh, during the project. Uh, you see here, this is a project that could be um, because we follow with the app all the all the path of the litter since the collection to the transport and to through the mod through the recycling. And in this case, uh, we can also have a tag. We can produce a tag uh, to, for the new products. You see here a table that was done with um, uh, with the marine litter collected. In uh, during the Maestro project, you see the the filaments here. The green is the color of the nets that we we use to re to produce this table. But the interesting thing is that the, this product could have a Maestro guaranteed marine litter. So it could have you know from an economical point of view, you could have a tag that uh, tells you exactly where this table uh, comes from. Um, as I said, we are also developing uh, this uh, artificial intelligence driven robotic system to segregate plastic from a litter because this is not so easy. You know, the sorting is always a bit uh, difficult, and also to recycle, you need, as you know, you need to separate different polymers and different kind of uh, of, uh, of plastics. And this is what uh, our partner Technalia is doing at the moment. They are. And they are developing this robot that should that will do it uh, with you know completely automatic so with uh, to to separate also the marine litter so we are collecting all the data to do to, to be able to do this 
But of course, as I said, I showed you an example of mechanical recycling where you, you, know, you make the litter in small pieces and you produce a new product. Uh, but, we, you, but what we, do we do when the, when the litter is so uh, dirty and so mixed that we cannot do that, then uh, we, uh, we have, we are part, we have our partners will also um, do another process as a chemical recycling, so it will transform chemically the, the, the litter and the plastics, separating the molecules and you know, isolating the molecules to produce new, pro new products. We have already demonstrated that it's possible to do this and to produce um, marine gas oil, for example, but we can also use produce NAFTA, which is, uh, uh, which is normally uh, produced from, uh, you know, from oil, uh, from fossils, uh, fossil uh, resources. But in this case, you would, uh, you would recover it from marine litter. And from the NAFTA, you can do, you know, a lot of uh, different products, uh, such as, uh, you know, new plastics or uh, cosmetics or, you know, pharmaceuticals, different, I mean, from the molecules, you can do uh, whatever you want practically. So, so um, these are different, you know, solutions that we have test, we are testing. Of course, this is not only the uh, activities, we are, we are not only uh, developing new technologies, we are trying to really cluster, and this is an example, this uh, webinar, really cluster and, uh, you know, join the efforts to, uh, to uh, tackle this issue. Uh, Maestrom has already um, organized two main in international workshop uh, on um, together with another um, twin project called Inoplastics, um, where we it's, it's focused really on removal of marine litter and circular economy, because as I said, it, there is a lot that we know about the monitoring, about as Mike Hilliard was saying, about the presence of the marine litter in the environment, but there is much less that we know about how to remove it and how you know, to recycle it. So this is, uh, these were some efforts that we are trying to to, um, to do, like to or also organize. I mean, it's more, uh, of course, uh, in, in Europe with the joining efforts also with other European projects and with all companies that are working on this. Uh, these are two examples of the, my, uh, the workshop they were organized, but we, have, we are not only focused on, on, uh, on uh, Europe, of course, we, we try also, we try to contribute. Uh, we have uh, participated with uh, different events at the UN Ocean Conference that was held, was held in Lisbon last year. And uh, we also submitted a policy brief to the United Nations Conference towards uh, this new global agreement. And we are trying also to, of course, contribute to, to this, to making our, our part. Uh, I want to say that uh, Maelstrom contributes to the EU mission, uh, the mission that has been launched by the European Union to really uh, restore our ocean and waters by 2030 is a big, big effort by the European, um, European Union, really investing a lot of money in projects and technologies and, and uh, you know, to try to and trying to connect, to network, to, to face this problem. So it's really taking activities. So Maestrom has uh, participated to different acti uh, activities of, uh, of the mission, but also joined the mission. I invite you all here, I attach this to, to join this because, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's uh, specifically for, for uh, the one based in Europe, it's really important that everybody, you know, try to join and to contribute. Uh, specifically, we will be a demonstration for the coordination strategic action of the European Union called a lighthouse uh, for coordinating and supportive uh, and supporting the, the innovation ecosystem for healthy pollution of free Mediterranean Sea because there is a focus of the mission on this uh, and we will be part of the Mediterranean lighthouse so uh, the targets are very ambitious so to reduce at least 50 percent plastic litter at sea to reduce at least 30 percent of microplastic released into the environment environment and to reduce at least 50% of nutrient losses. I mean, we, of course, are more focusing to the first uh, target, but we will try to contribute to all of them. So um, we also, uh, uh, we also, uh, 
I, of course, I said uh, we are making a lot of activities to engage societies, uh, society and marine litter, to marine litter prevention removal economy. We had large cleanup events. We will have more this June and September in both in Venice and uh, in the Porto region. We have redeveloped the three plastic ways you know, what, what, with, that we use with the recycle, recycled plastic that we use for uh, communication activities. But of course, we have we're more invo very involved in social media, and and, uh, and we did a lot of several dissemination activities on with schools uh, and uh, um, in general and specific workshop for local stakeholders, which is very important. We think because uh, you know uh, we propose some solutions that need to be also um, you know agreed with the local stakeholders. And this is a very, you know, very challenging task. Um, and um, so we have, uh, you know, we have been under the press uh, attention, the media attention for several, uh, in several uh, occasions. And this is all, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Fantina, for the very interesting presentation of the project Maelstrom. Also showing how joining the efforts from different areas and stakeholders can be probably the ultimate and real solution to effectively tackle this problem. Now it's time to explore the co-detection and the impacts of marine litter from plankton to marine mammals, from nanoplastics to fish, uh, and uh, also macro litter in megafauna. And do we start with Rodrigo Almeida, that will talk about uh, the small but very important uh, little organisms, the plankton. Uh, or, uh, Rodrigo is a researcher in the University of Las Palmas in Gran Canaria, Spain, working on marine plankton ecology and also on the effects of emerging contaminants in zooplankton. Uh, Rodrigo's presentation will focus on the co-detection of microplastics and the effects of the additives, the plastic additives on marine plankton, also including the zooplankton and potential effects on the food web levels. And uh, welcome, Rodrigo, again. Thank you. Floor, the floor is yours. Hi, Luis. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, hello, everyone around the world. And I will talk, I uh, will try to share my presentation now. Let's see. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Luis, for the invitation to this uh, webinar. And I will start talking about microplastics. Well, we know that microplastics are now everywhere. For those that are new in the topic, we are, there are different classification about what is microplastics. One is the, the most affected one is uh, plastic particles between one micron and five millimeters. And how we collect or sample uh, microplastics from the environment. So there is a kind of a standardized uh, methodology where is the Mantanet, that is this one here, where uh, when uh, you can collect microplastic uh, larger than three microns. And of course, there is a, like a new devices focused on microplastic sampling, like this type of uh, palm filter devices, where you can collect smaller particles down to 10 to 20 microns. We also know that there are several uh, monitoring programs about plankton that they has been established in different uh, coastal areas in the Mediterranean and other places around the world, where it's commonly used, uh, like for example, like uh, this kind of nets called uh, ver for vertical sampling of zooplankton, and also this kind of multi nets when you can also sample in different uh, water layers. So this is actually an opportunity to. Um, a co-study or co-monitoring co plastics and plankton. And uh, I was discussing with uh, Luis one a good example of opportunity to do this kind of um, collaborations is this uh, continued plankton recorder survey. It's one of the surveys, the oldest ones, as far as I know. It was started in 1931. And they have been collecting samples with this kind of, I don't know, you can see here on the, on the left, is this kind of a torpedo-shaped device 
where he's collecting uh, plankton samples. He have a mess inside of 270 microns. So they have been collecting samples, as I said, all around the world uh, with, um, with a huge frequency. So these samples actually, they are storage, stored to, to, um, invest, to investigate or study uh, for plankton, but at the same time could be used to look at the microplastics and in that way, we just uh, join efforts and money and uh, technology to try to do these two important tasks on the uh, environmental task, try to fix like, in one side, we can see biodiversity of zooplankton and also uh, microplastic abundance and composition and size, for example. Uh, talking about uh, microplastics, so I will just Briefly, so one of our last studies uh, where we investigate the, the concentration and abundance and composition of microplastics in Danish waters. And one of the major conclusions were for sure we found microplastics everywhere in the water. The concentration depends on the area. It can go from like 20 to 80 or 200 microplastic by cubic meter. But the, the, the clear conclusion of our all of our studies is like most of the microplastics are smaller than 300 microns, up to 90% of the microplastic. That means that only using like a manta net or this kind of nets that I saw before is not enough to have a clear idea of the abundance of microplastic in the environment because we are losing a, a big part of it. So I think a good monitoring program should be also include or an effort to have other system to monitor like a smaller plastics, like down to one micron at least. And of course, nanoplastic, but that's a different story where it's quite complicated. So also another important aspect for uh, monitoring is, is like choosing a hotspot or critical places that they can give a good idea about what how is the, 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 the dynamics of uh, pollution in the environment? Are we reducing the amount of plastic in the environment with the, with the, with the lows and the strategies we are using? So for that, I will just, I is showing here an example of the Canary Islands, where is where I live now. And we have identified uh, like places where actually microplastics uh, accumulate more in surface waters. Uh, we can call it hot, hot spots of plastic pollution. And it's mainly in the south of the islands, of uh, some of the islands of uh, the Canary Islands, the tallest ones. So we found that in the leeward zone, actually there is a high accumulation, accumulation of microplastics. And sometimes there is a formation of um, this, I don't know, you can see here in the picture, it's these lines of accumulate floating plastics that now they are called marine litter windrows. So in this concentration of plastic, we actually find a huge amount of uh, microplastic compared with the rest of the waters around. So we are now doing an effort actually to monitor in these areas uh, every month to see, to try to, to see how is the, the concentration of plastics. Okay, now we'll move to the next topic is plastic additives. Well, when we think about plastic, we always thought about the main synthetic polymer like polyesterine, polypropylene. But actually plastics are a cocktail of chemicals. So there is hundreds of chemicals that they are added to the main uh, polymer to give it uh, different properties. For example, there are plastic sires, a flame retardant, antioxidants. All these together are called plastic additives. And we have a problem because for many of these chemicals, we don't have a toxicity characterization or risk assessment. And what happened with the plastic uh, rich environment? We already know that plastic can absorb contaminants that they were on the water, but plastics can also leach these additives that they were adding during the production. And then these uh, additives are available uh, to the plankton by passive diffusion, all their sources. And this is actually get the attention of the scientific community recently because it has been found after 20 years of research that 
the population of the coho salmon in uh, North America in some specific areas, it was actually it was having like a recurrent mortality every time there was a rain runoff event. So then they they investigate the causes and they found that one of the additives present in the tire uh, the car tires when enter the environment it leach and this additive is transformed in a in a different compound. I just put here the name. 6 ppd quinone, and then it becomes neurotoxic to the salmon. So the main reason this is of the mortality of the sample, it was actually a single additive present in car tires. So this is a, one of the biggest examples of evidence of ecological impact of microplastics. So this motivate, uh, well, this and all the topic uh, motivate uh, my research uh, in different projects. Uh, now I'm actually I'm the principal investigator of this project called Micropleach about the impact of plastic uh, leaches in planting. And we also are part of the response project of the GPI Oceans, where we are like a four, uh, 14 institutions for all Europe also working about a risk assessment of microplastic pollution in marine ecosystems. Well, for, for those that they are not familiar with plankton, we know that plankton, they are very small, but they play big roles in the ocean in the, and even in the global biochemical processes. I put here sun samples so everyone can understand why plankton is so important. You will have the presentation available. And, and then in this project, what we did is we focus on main um, stone groups in the in the marine ecosystem. We investigate uh, phytoplankton, microalgae, protozoans, planktonic uh, invertebrate larvae, and also copepods, and the effects of leaches of different materials, uh, car tires, uh, theorobats, uh, microplastics, and also bioplastic or biopolymers. So, just as a summary, in most of the groups, we found like car tire particles, leeches from car tires, and also theory, but they were very toxic to all the organisms that we investigate. Here is for some, it's an example of the effects of leeches of theory bats on a microalgae. So you can see how the, the concentration of cells decreased uh, dramatically when the phytoplankton was exposed to these leaches. And this is quite important because the new models estimate that car tire particles actually are the dominant source or one of the dominant source of microplastic in the environments. And when we look at the monitoring programs, we found that actually the current methodology we use exclude these kind of particles. So it's not included because the, the properties of the elastomers we don't have actually a quantification of how many particles are, but we are only based on models of sources. So we need to also focus on these non-conventional plastic uh, particles. This is also an example of the impact of car tire leaches that, uh, um, that we investigate here in the Canary Islands of these three important species of sea urchins. And in all cases, we found Efforts like a malformation, delayed in the development, and mortality depending on the species. Quite interesting was also the comparison between a biopolymer or bioplastics, where it's supposed to be the alternative of conventional plastics, and plastics, normal ones, collected from the beach. We actually found the leeches were toxic at a relatively high concentration, but the bioplastic it was actually more toxic than the microplastic collected from the beach. And this is because the biopolymers, they are still including these toxic uh, additives that they are adding for producing the plastics. So even if it's biodegradable, they can, when the bioplastic potentially enter in the environment, they can still leach this toxic compound and cause toxicity. And finally, what happened with the plastics spent a long time in the environment, what is called water it, and they lost these compounds. So with this and long term research with plastic that, that has been like uh, watered for uh, long periods, 
And we actually found that they were not causing any impact on the plankton community. And this was because they lost all these leeches. So the particles actually, they were not affecting themselves to the organisms when they were without leeches. So what is the next step? We know that the leeches from plastic are toxic, but leeches are a cocktail of chemicals. So what we are trying to do is identify which of these uh, different compounds is the one causing the toxicity or the ones. So for that, we are doing chemical fractionation of the leeches where we separate chemically the leeches in different fractions. And then we can test again on organisms and see which one of these fractions they were more toxic. And then we can do retest until we identify if it's one single compound or several ones. To conclude, and we can open the discussion. So what is our main conclusion of our studies is like actually leeches, which contains the plastic additives, are the main responsible of the harmful effects of mycoplastic on plankton. There is two less study plastics that is tower particles, a theory bats that they are of high environmental concern in coastal areas, particularly in uh, urban areas close to roads after runout events. We can see there is a high potential of uh, ecological impact. Also quite important in terms of, uh, for the industry and to reduce the impact. The new biopolymers have a similar or even higher toxicity than the conventional plastic on plankton. And this is a problem because we need to find an alternative. But if the alternative is using the same additive, it's not a real good alternative for the environment. And to putting all this together in the context of the monitoring programs, we also need to monitor the, the plastic additives and try to develop techniques to, to quantify this because the same uh, polymer, it has very different toxicity depending on the additives they have because the toxicity will depend on the additives. And just to conclude, one we identify with these uh, toxic additives are, we have a solution collaborating with the industry to find alternative, alternative ways uh, and safer uh, plastic additives. Because of course, these additives are necessary to give the properties, but in the, in the market, they can try to find alternatives that it will cause a less uh, or a minimized impact in the environment. And with that, that's all. Thank you, Luis. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for a very interesting contribution presentation. And in fact, very interesting projects that you are Thank coordinating. You. Congratulations. And also to, for highlighting the importance that we need to give more attention to these little organisms. They are key organisms in the ocean and they are recognized biological indicators. And in fact, the continuous plankton records is not uh, a new technology but I think it's the needed technology that we need now for co-monitoring. We need urgent data at this level. Yeah. Thank you, Rodrigo. So moving now to the next level, increasing the size of the organisms, but decreasing the size of the particles. Let's now explore the world of nanopar nanoparticles, nanoplastics, in fact, with Mariana Telsch. Mariana is a researcher from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. She works on the effects of nanoplastics in seafood with special focus on fish. Welcome, Mariana. Again, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. You can share the presentation. Yes, just let me know if it is okay. Uh, the, we put in the presentation modes. Yes. Okay. Is it, is it okay? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Can you see it now? Yes, it's in PowerPoint mode. Yes. But it's in presentation mode in my... Maybe well, we, I should... You have to select another screen. Okay. No, it's okay. 
Okay. Can you listen to me, isn't it? Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this webinar. Very interesting webinar. It is a pleasure for me to be here. I'm Mariana Telz, as Luis told. I'm a researcher uh, and a teacher at Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona in Spain. And I will show you some of the results that we get concerning the effects of nanoplastics in fish. So now I cannot end the slide. Okay, so in our lab, we work with different um, models, both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, but today I will only talk about three fish species that we usually use for our studies. First of the, the studies was carried out with zebrafish. We use both a zebrafish liver cell line that we call ZFL, and we use zebrafish larvae. Uh, and we perform a short-term exposure to very small polystyrene nanoplastics with 50 nanometers. And we wanted to know uh, if the zebrafish liver cells were able to uptake the nanoplastics from the medium, uh, where they uh, will localize inside the cells and how they will interact with the cellular machinery. And we also wanted to know if the zebrafish larvae, they were able to uptake the nanoplastics from the water and where they will accumulate inside the larva. Moreover, we have an important question to answer, and it was if a pre-exposure of this larva to nanoplastics will affect its posterior capacity of, of cope with an infection uh, by the bacteria Aramona hydrophila. So, when we go into our in vitro results, we have the confocal microscopy photographies. And in blue, we can see uh, the nucleus stained in blue. We can see stained in purple the cell membrane and the polystyrene nanoplastics in, in green. And when we put all this together, we can clearly see that nanoplastics are inside the citadel of the cell. When we were looking deeper into our, our results, um, it seemed that the nanoplastics were mainly accumulated in the lysosomes. So we used the LISA tracker, which stain in red the um, lysosomes, and we could see that the nanoplastics were really inside the lysosomes where they mainly accumulate. Then we moved to our in vivo results and uh, we exposed the larva to two sublethal concentrations of polystyrene nanoplastics. And we, what did we find? We find that the larva, they were able to uptake the nanoplastics from the water and that they mainly accumulate in the pancreas and in the gut. Even if we were expecting accumulation in the liver, in this case, we couldn't find them in the liver. Then uh, we take these larvae that were exposed and accumulate nanoplastics, and we perform a bacterial challenge and we monitor the survival uh, during the seven days after the infection. So in this graph, we can see in black the absolute control and in green the survival of the larvae that were exposed to nanoplastics. And we can see that the uh, survival does not, the exposure to nanoplastics does not affect the survival of the larva. Then we have in brown the control of the infection with the expected mortality along the time after the infection. And when we have a look in the red and in the orange line, we can see that the larva that was uh, previously exposed to nanoplastics have the same survival as the larva that uh, are coping with infection. So it seems that the pre-exposure is not affecting the survival or the capacity of the larva to cope with a bacterial infection. So the main findings from this study are that uh, we prove that uh, nanoplastics are uptaken by the cells and they are mainly accumulated in the lysosomes. They are also taken by the larva and they mainly accumulate in the gut and in the pancreas. And that the pre-exposure to nanoplastics have no effect on the final survival of the zebrafish larva after an infection. Now I will move to an experiment that we carried out in building. Had siblings, Parusaurata, which we 
is one of the most important aquaculture and consumed fish species in the Mediterranean area. And we perform a short-term exposure to a range of nanoplastics concentration, also very small nanoplastics. After that, uh, we sample the liver and the blood. And in this case, we focus on the lipid metabolism pathways and in the antioxidant response. And what did we find? We found that an exposure to nanoplastics uh, induced an increased expression of the mRNA transcripts related with lipid metabolism pathways, such as, for example, the peroxisome proliferated activated receptors, and also of genes that codifies for proteins involved in the transport of lipids in the plasma, like, for example, lipoprotein lipase. Concerning antioxidant-related um, genes, we can see an activation of the antioxidant genes at early times, at 24 hours, seems that the exposure to nanoplastics is activating the transcriptional machinery of the cell, uh, maybe to cope with oxidative stress imposed by the nanoplastic. However, at 96 hours, this uh, regained control levels, uh, which seems that the animal um, were able to cope with, with the stress. Um, when we move to the biochemical parameters in the liver, we found no liver damage since the liver uh, damage enzymes are not altered. We did not find changes in the parameters related with lipid metabolism, but uh, our results of TAC, which is total antioxidant capacity, go in hand with the molecular results and we can see an increase in the antioxidant capacity of the animal. However, this was not enough because sporadically, we can see oxidative stress measured by the TOS, which is the total oxidative status of the animal, in this case, in, measured in the liver. Then we move to more systemic response and we measure these parameters in the plasma. And here, yes, we find that our results in plasma, biochemical results, go in hand but with molecular results because we have an increase and in an activation of the total antioxidant capacity and also an increase in cholesterol and triglycerides in the plasma, indicating a change or an alteration in the lipid metabolism of the animal and possibly its capacity to uh, handle its energetic reserves. So then we also uh, study genotoxicity markers, erythrocytic nuclear abnormalities, and we found uh, DNA damage after exposure to nanoplastics, even if it was a short-term exposure. Okay, so the main findings from this study carried out uh, with Spar Zaurata. Uh, let us to say that we have alterations in the lipid metabolism, both at the molecular and the biochemical level, we have an activation of the antioxidant defenses at earlier time, but we have genotoxicity uh, in the blood. Okay, so then we move to a chronic study because the other studies, uh, as I told, were after short-term exposures, and we consider that in the environment, it's more likely that chronic exposures to nanoplastics will occur. So. In this case, we used the model fish species, the laboratory model, uh, goldfish, and we expose it during 30 days to nanoplastics. After this, we sample the blood, muscle, gut, and the liver. And as uh, Mike told, and as we all know, there's a great difficulty with the techniques, mainly for quantification of nanoplastics. And until this moment, most of these techniques uh, are done with using fluorescent and quantifying the fluorescence of fluorescent particles. So uh, in collaboration with IEA, uh, with the people from HIDAEA in Barcelona, uh, in this study, we set up a protocol for the analysis and quantification of nanoplastic polymers by um, size exclusion chromatography and high resolution mass spectrometry. And what did we find? So we did not find nanoplastics in the gastrointestinal pack, but we did find nanoplastics in all the liver and muscle samples. And we also see that nanoplastics are present at higher concentrations in the liver, but they are also present in the muscle, which is the edible part of the animal. 
Then when we have a look on the health and welfare indicators such as growth, such as the stress hormone cortisol or in the hematological indicators, we could see that the animals uh, are in good health and welfare conditions, even if they are accumulating nanoplastics. But once again, and corroborating our data in Sebring and previous data that we got in muscles, we have genotoxicity, which means that the exposure to nanoplastics is causing irreversible DNA damage, maybe due to the oxidative stress caused by the nanoplastics or due to the direct interaction of nanoplastics with the chromosomal material, as we could see in the first photos that they enter and they interact and they accumulate inside the cells. So this accumulation of DNA damage in the cells may play a role in their mutagenic potential and can escalate to other conditions such as cancer, for example. So the main findings of our chronic study carried out with goldfish led us to say that nanoplastics are internalized by the fish from the water they cross um, the epithelial, intestinal epithelium, and they move in the bloodstream and they accumulate in internal organs. We found higher levels of nanoplastics in the liver and no bioaccumulation in the gastrointestinal tract, probably due to the absorptive function of this organ. Uh, we did not find changes in the health and welfare indicators, but we find genotoxicity, which can escalate to mutagenicity. So putting all our results together, what did we find? We find physiological changes such as alterations in the lipid metabolism pathways and um, in the oxidative stress. We also find some inflammatory responses in other studies that I did not present today. Uh, we found a genotoxicity, we found bioaccumulation, and we also have indications from unpublished results that exposure to nanoplastics is causing reproductive alterations in the zebrafish. So what can happen? So this, all these effects um, are affecting the species. Probably they can escalate through the trophic transfer, affecting other species and also the men. Uh, with all this together having a potential impact at the po population and biodiversity level. And uh, this is potentially can be a uh, treat to human health since uh, we, we hit the edible part of the animals and herein we have seen accumulation in the muscle. Finally, I want to thank all of you for listening, for inviting me and also to my uh, group and to the Ministerio Gobierno de España, because uh, we are working in the scope of a project that allow us to do this research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana, for a very interesting presentation and for bringing us uh, this not well-known but orring world of nanoplastics, also highlighting the possible effects on biodiversity and uh, also uh, with special focus on uh, seafood that is consumed by humans. Thank you. Reaching now the top of marine food, food web, Matteo Galli will talk about the presence and impacts of marine litter on marine megafauna, including marine turtles and cetaceans. Matteo Galli is a researcher in the University of Siena in Italy, and uh, he investigates the impacts of marine litter at several levels with a special focus on ecotoxicological implications of this emerging contamination. Welcome, Matteo, again. Thank you for accepting the invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Luis, for inviting me. And also, thank you. I am going to share the screen. Also, thank you to all on behalf of my supervisor, Maria Cristina Fossi. And um, tell me if if you see my presentation on full screen. Uh, not yet. Now, yes. Okay. So let's start. Um, basically, the this presentation, as you said, Luis, focus on the evaluation of the impact impacts of marine litter on Mediterranean uh, megafauna. 
The uh, Mediterranean Sea is a biodiversity hotspot area, but despite that, it is characterized by high level of uh, pollutants, including marine litter and in particular plastic. Uh, despite the huge amount of data that have been published in the, in the last year, uh, there are still some gaps to fill in regarding the ecological status of the marine protected areas and in particular, the uh, physical and chemical impacts related to the ingestion of uh, the marine litter and plastics. With uh, this aim, the Plastic Buster MPAs project aims to uh, implement the prevention and mitigation action to reduce the impact of, mal of marine litter, standardize and promote um, a shared uh, protocol um, through the uh, scientific uh, community, and finally define a joint governance plan that could be used as model in other marine protected areas. Uh, the um, investigated area uh, has been the uh, specially protected area of Mediterranean importance, the Pelagos Sanctuary, um, located in the northwestern sector of the Mediterranean Sea, and inside this area, the largest marine national park, the Tuscan Archipelago National Park. Basically, in these two uh, areas, uh, an experimental design based on three uh, different phases have been carried out, starting from the collection of data on uh, presence and abundances of litter in different ecological compartments from the sea surface to beaches, uh, moving through uh, an evaluation of physical and chemical impacts on several bioindicators along the marine traffic chain and mixing all the uh, information previously uh, assessed to uh, perform a, a special risk analysis. Uh, with this background, the aim of this study was to show you uh, some data uh, regarding the physical and chemical impacts of the marine litter in uh, sea turtle species and cetacean species found stranded along the coast of the Pelagos Sanctuary, uh, with a special focus to the characterization of plastic ingested and the levels of phthalate ester described before also uh, for the other colleagues as one of the main uh, plasticizers associated with, with plastic. Finally, I will show you the um, uh, risk assessment analysis uh, highlighting the areas in this protected area, the Pelagos Sanctuary, more at risk for the uh, marine organisms. So, um, we what we what what we have done we have um, developed and test a new uh, prototype to better isolate the litter ingested from stranded organisms in collaboration with the University of Padova. This prototype basically consists of different sieves with different mesh, and it allowed to collect particles up to 100 micron. micron. Uh, the organic matter that has been uh, collected on each seed has been digested through uh, a solution of potassium hydroxide and filtered under a vacuum pump system. Each filter has been uh, observed under a stereo microscope and each isolated particle uh, has been uh, characterized according to their its uh, physical and chemical composition. Uh, regarding the evaluation of phthalate ester levels, a new uh, extraction method has been developed, basically uh, based on a ultrasonic extraction step and a subsequent purification step through the dispersive. Eleven phthalate different compounds have been uh, evaluated. In, in total. Moving to the, the results, uh, regarding sea turtle, two species have been analyzed, the loggerhead 
turtle, Careta Careta, and the green turtle, the Colonia Midas. Uh, litter have, have been found uh, in both these species with the higher uh, concentration uh, found in the loggerhead sea turtle. Um, regarding the, the size of plastic found, the, uh, the, the majority had a uh, um, size larger than five millimeters, so belonging to the category uh, named as mesoplastic and macroplastic, while uh, microplastic have been found only in for individuals of Caretta Caretta. Uh, regarding the shape, sheet-like plastic, thread-like, and fragment have been uh, the particle most, most found. Uh, moving to the uh, physical effect, uh, phthalate ester have been detected in two different biological tissue, the fat and liver. No statistical differences have been uh, found between the two species, but we have we ha what we have found is that in general, the, the fat uh, is the uh, tissue uh, where phthalates tends to uh, accumulate. And uh, uh, also uh, what we have found is a um, different fingerprint of accumulation between uh, the two uh, species. In particular, the high molecular weight compounds were detected mainly in the Colonia Midas, while the low molecular weight compounds have been detected in Caretta Caretta. This difference could be uh, related uh, also uh, could be related mainly to the differences in the diet of these two species, being the Colonia Midas uh, on herbivorous organisms, while in the Caretta Caretta uh, is omnivorous. Moving to the cetacean, uh, four different species have been analyzed. Three um, odontocyte species, the Stenella cerulea alba, Turcio truncatus, and Ziphius cavirostris, and one mysticate species, the Balenoptera physalus, the Mediterranean fin whale. Plastic have been isolated from uh, all the species with the highest concentration uh, with the highest uh, and also occurrence in the Mediterranean thin wave. Uh, this is uh, some examples, some photos of the particle isolated from the, all the, the species analyzed. Uh, plastic were uh, basically made of polyethylene and polypropylene and uh, are mm, fragment, mainly fragment, uh, uh, file filaments and, and film. Regarding the phthalates, uh, also for the cetacean, two different uh, biological tissue have been analyzed, the blubber and the liver. The highest concentration were found in the blubber of the bottlenose, the common bottlenose dolphin, the Tursio truncatus. This is the more coastal species among those analyzed. And this, the higher concentration of phthalate could uh, suggest a potential uh, impact of uh, plastic and uh, um, contaminants. Um, released by this plastic once ingested. Um, as you know, uh, plastic tends to accumulate in, in the coastal area, so this species could be uh, more exposed uh, regarding the, the other to, to this type of um, pollution. Uh, we have found also a difference in the um, fingerprint of accumulation with the high molecular weight compounds mainly present in liver and the lower in the, the blubber. For the um, Mediterranean fin whale, we have analyzed also other biological tissue uh, showing higher concentration of phthalates, especially in heart and kidney. And uh, is, it is important to highlight how in liver was detected a special compound, the isononyl phthalate, uh, described as toxic even at low concentration, and particularly um, affin to the accumulation in this, in this tissue. Uh, the final part of this presentation will focus on the, the risk assessment. Uh, 
basically uh, during the uh, marine litter sampling campaign uh, data regarding the distribution of uh, marine organisms have been uh, collected at least by three marine mammal observers. These data uh, have been used to uh, calculate uh, the encounter rates for each species and uh, they uh, define the core area and the general area of distribution for, for each species. These uh, two kinds of uh, distribution have been overlaid to the distribution of marine litter, floating marine litter, to evaluate the areas representing a higher risk for these organisms. So, um, in total, we have seen the 17 species, and for four of these species, uh, a statistical relationship between uh, their distribution and the distribution of marine litter have been found. And in this map, you, you can see the area more at risk representing a higher risk of exposure for the marine organisms. And it is represented by the Genoa Canyon, the continental shelf, the continental area, the coastal area of the Liguria and the, in the Tuscan archipelago, and the, uh, with a lower risk, the Western Canyon and Northeastern sector of the Corsica Island. In conclusion, what we, we can say is that sea turtle has been confirmed as a reliable indicator to evaluate the ingestion of marine litter, as uh, suggested the, by the uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the UNEP map common indicator. And the fat tissue has been identified as a benchmark for the phthalate ester detection in these, in these species. For the first time in the Mediterranean, fin whale was detected the presence of the uh, microplastics and the different accumulation of the compounds investigated shed the light on, on the metabolic pathways uh, that this compound could have and also the toxicological effects that these pollutants uh, may have on these endangered species. And finally, the Pelagos Sanctuary, uh, these specially protected areas, is um, resulted as heavy polluted by marine litter, with some area, uh, especially near the Gulf of La Spezia, the Tuscan Archipelago, and the Genoa Canyon, um, characterized by a higher risk of exposure for the uh, species investigated. So. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Matteo, for a very nice presentation. Um, I think uh, you show the terrible impacts of uh, macro litter in these organisms, even in protected areas. I believe uh, that uh, this result, and especially these shocking images, can also work as keys for effective and collaborative programs that we need for marine biodiversity. So we reached the end of this session. Thank you again to, for, to all speakers for the very comprehensive and global view on the effects and the co-detection solutions for marine litter. I think with this, all, all these contributions, we have the ingredients to move on to the round table of this webinar. Uh, that will work as a think tank. We have prepared several questions and we have some questions from the audience. This session will be moderated by Isabel Sousa Pinto. Isabel is a professor in the Faculty of Sciences in the University of Porto and head of Coastal Biodiversity Group in CIMAR. She, she is also the co-chair of Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. Her research focus on marine ecology on the multiple impacts on marine, marine biodiversity with uh, important work on stakeholders' engagement and science policy. Thank you, Isabel. Again, the round table is yours. Well, thank you, Luis. This will be a co-chaired uh, round table. Since we don't have a lot of time, we have three questions prepared. But what I propose is I, I ask the first question and see who wants to respond. 
uh, uh, this is for all of you. Um, anyway, I don't see uh, uh, Fantina and Maria, and I think we still need one more. Uh, but anyway, so I'll ask just one question, and then we go to the questions from the public, because I would like them to be also that you have time to respond to those. So I would like to, so we all know that the main, let's say, long-term solution for marine litter is prevention. Uh, we cannot, I mean, we can continue to make devices to take the litter out and to find where the litter is, but the most important thing is that we work on the prevention. We did not really talk about this a lot in this webinar, but you all work on this. So I would ask you, uh, what are the things, in your experience, what are the main missing areas or missing uh, steps that uh, that we should work on to really improve the, the, the collaboration, not only among researchers, we have a history of collaboration, but of course, uh, cooperation between different uh, fields. Here we are already bringing together two fields like biodiversity people and those that work more on, on contamination. Uh, but also with the different stakeholders, policy makers, uh, managers, and so on. And maybe I ask first Mike, but then anyone else that wants to, to add uh, to this question. So where do we think is the main gaps now on this collaboration? That, th thanks, Isabel. Yes, and, and I, I think I'm going to say something that you and I have talked about before, and that is, um, uh, Natural scientists, as you've just seen, we're all very good at, at showing where the problems are. To show where the solutions are, we need the social scientists. And as you're doing in the in the Milestone project, uh, we need engineers as well. So the natural scientists are very good at saying where the problems are, but where the solutions are, that comes from social science and from behavioral science and those. So the, project, the projects that we're involved in, and, and um, uh, you would have seen the logos on, on, on starts my slide, I'm involved in, in four uh, Horizon Europe projects uh, at the moment, as in Isabel's in, in some of those as well. Um, and within those, what we're trying to do is bring the natural sciences and social sciences together. This is where the hope lies. Um, the, the difficulty is if any of you go and talk to your politicians and your decision makers, if you talk to them about plankton or talk to them about the benthos or sediments, uh, you'll watch their eyes, their eyes go, their eyes glaze over. But if you talk about to them about money and employment and you talk to them about people's health, then those politicians take notice. So go and talk to them about those problems due to uh, plastics. And then once you've got them interested, then you can talk about environmental health. But it, it, the main point is we, we need all of these um, disciplines to work together. Uh, and between uh, so OK, so this is the so the way to go to the to the other stakeholders like policy makers and managers. And so you think that the social scientists could help us on that? I, I, I think, I think Isabel, they, they have to, because the social scientists talk in, in, in that language. Um, it's been like, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, Bill Clinton said a while ago when, when asked what is the most important point, and he says it's, it's, it's the economy, stupid. Everyone yeah. takes notice, especially now, you know, now we've got you no know, problems with the economy in all of our countries and the economics. And if, if you can tell people there are economic benefits of not only stopping um, plastics going out, but also treating them afterwards, then I think they take notice. But yeah, it's um, as someone said about pollution, they said the, um, uh, the, the problem is people and the solution is people. So yeah. that's what we have to look at. Anyone else would like to add something? Uh, yes, if I may, uh, Isabel. Yeah. 
So uh, thank you for the question. I mean, it's very hard. Of course, we are everybody is trying to do his part. I, I should mention that the European Union is putting a lot of effort in this mission to restore ocean uh, and waters by 2030. And uh, this is what uh, they're also trying to do to put everybody together, not only the scientists, but also, uh, you know, social scientists, eco economists, uh, and, and so on. Um, I, so, the, so this is uh, one part of what we're trying to do. I mean, is to, you know, developing, we, we are in research uh, innovation action where we develop uh, new technological solutions. Of course, these are the, uh, you know, the very advanced technologies to answer one of the questions that was in the chat uh, that might be very expensive. But of course, as you know, uh, technology, so you, you, this is the edge of research in this topic, but this of course has also, uh, so we start with this, but then it, it has a reverberation also on other, um, on, the, on the economy in a, in a different way. So the research is uh, at the edge, but then uh, you, uh, you transform the society slowly also by proposing new technological solution. If we, if we think, for example, of internet, this derives from the you know, technological innovation that was related to the developing of the CERN center to store the data for high uh, energy uh, particle experiments. So you don't know what you get when you start research. So you, you need to, of course, this is a you know, high level research that you don't know which consequences could have in the economy. So you, and we try to, of course, this is a practical example of a project that tries to do something practical, but uh, uh, you, it needs to be translated as you as you are as some of you uh, highlighted in the in the in the chat. Uh, it needs to be translated also in solutions that are affordable, that are you know economically advanced, uh, you know sustainable, and of course environmentally sustainable. This is also one point that we want to uh, to address in in our project. Um, so there are of course. Uh, you know, you don't know what you, you produce when you start uh, uh, things like that. But uh, um, of course, you cannot say, okay, you, you will have a robot to clean uh, maybe in, in, you know, in very remote areas. Uh, it will not be maybe economically feasible. But, uh, um, but this is uh, something that you might think to use where you have big accumulation, you can start fundraising. I mean, you need to, you know, move in this direction so to, to show that the, the technology can offer also new economical opportunities and a new uh, sectors of industry as well so uh, i know it's a bit uh, <laughs> you know uh, to the future but uh, this is the start otherwise uh, we don't do anything we just say okay this is a problem and that's it yeah no, exactly. And actually, I just wanted to, to highlight something that I heard here that, for instance, that really shows the value of science and that we have to continue to look at this, even though we, of course, then need action on the ground. But for instance, this that uh, the plastic additives really can make a big difference that Rodrigo showed uh, on, on the toxicity. This is very important because this is a, a different action, even if we still have plastics, but we may have less toxic plastics. This is something that we would not know if we did not do the research. But since we are getting close to our finishing time, I will pass to uh, Luis that is going to uh, ask some of the questions that we had our um, participants. So they, they can also put questions. Thank you, Isabel. Yes, we have here some interesting questions. One are more technical, one others more more global. Probably starting with uh, this, my Mokobunda asking about uh, microplastics. Uh, I think is a general questions for all, all the panelists. Uh, he's asking uh, what are the gaps uh, on the effects of microplastics in organisms, what do we need, what we don't know yet, or are explored, and uh, what we know about the position of microplastics in inland aquatic environments. Uh, thanks, uh, Louis. If I if I just start off with that, and I I tried starting to answer it in the chat, and and uh, I don't know how much went in there. 
Um, the, the, the gaps, as you've seen today, I think um, it's quite interesting. When we, when we started looking at uh, problems like organic pollution, we started looking at the changes to ecosystems and communities, uh, usually the benthos. And then, we, when, then when we started saying, well, can we find lower level effects in uh, populations, in individuals and in cells? Now, as you've seen this afternoon, especially the, 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 the study that Mariana showed, what we're doing with, um, with microplastics is we've started from the other end. We've started looking at the effects in individuals but we don't know if those effects in the individuals will get translated through to um, whole organisms, then to populations, then to communities and eventually to ecosystems. Now, that um, the very detailed horrendogram I showed of the, the effects of pollutants in fish. One of the things we tried to show when we did that work is that fish can take up pollutants but actually the effects of them get absorbed. There's so many links in that chain that the effects get absorbed. So even though one fish might be polluted um, uh, or contaminated and show pollution effects, by the time you take the whole population, that effect has been filtered out. It's, it's not seen because just because there's so many things that kill fish, trying to determine Plastics killing fish from and everything else is really difficult. And it's what we call um, environmental homeostasis. So I think that's where we're going at the moment, that we can we can show the effects very well, as, as, as Mariana did and, and Matteo did. We can show the effects very well at individual level, but it comes out of the so what. So what will it be effect at populations, communities and, and so on? and up to the ecosystem. Um, as for the inland, yes, uh, I mean, this is where most of the, the contaminants are coming from. Every time you use your domestic washing machine, there are millions of microfibers come out of it. And the problem we've got, um, the, 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 the washing machine manufacturers have said they could create a washing machine that doesn't release microfibers. The only problem is you would need a large centrifuge at side of it and um, and your washing machine probably wouldn't let the water out either. So it, it's it, it is this problem. Thank you, Mike. I don't know if uh, the other colleagues want to answer this question. Well, just just to add some some, some words. I, I don't I don't know very much about England. I work more way out at sea, but I totally agree with the professor Elliot and also on what he says before about the we, we need to um, to better to to put together all, all the knowledge uh, to to really um, acquire to gain. Uh, information about all, all, all and, and information and address all, all the cycle, the, the litter, all the cycle of, of the marine litter. And regarding the the, the impacts, yes, I, I totally agree with. We, we need to, to better uh, focus on uh, population on on population effects, and not only focusing on the uh, the individuals. And to get um, a picture, a uh, comprehensive picture about the exposure, uh, not only on plastic, but uh, or litter in, in general, but also to the, the contaminant that we obviously we, we, we don't see, but they're still there, uh, as today we, we show. So um, there is a lot of work to do. Um, so we keep on 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 this on this issue. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, I think we are in the end, but probably with one two minutes for hearing a very interesting question. I think is directed for Maelstrom. Uh, we have here a participant asking if we can implement these technologies in other environments, including 
ocean. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, this is of course uh, what we aim to, and uh, this is also something that we we are trying to really in these days we we will discuss how we can really prepare a sort of package that to present the technology to see how much they cost how you can uh, uh, you can uh, what is the what are the problematics involved with the, 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 the implementation and the deployment of these technologies and what are the costs to involve the stakeholders to you know uh, to adopt them uh, and uh, to uh, implement them. So uh, in order to be able to, of course, reproduce it in other parts of the world. As I said, there are different technologies with different, I mean, we, we have shown the bubble barrier, the seabed cleaning platform, which is a robotic system that is uh, you know, very complicated, but uh, we have also other, uh, other technologies that we are developing to recycle marine litter. And this, you know, you can also, you know, do something when you do cleanups activities and you don't know what to do instead of redumping or just delivering to the waste management system. So to, to really have technologies that can be transferred. Uh, also where, the, because, you know, as, a, um, as we saw in a Mike Elliott uh, talk, uh, the problem is, a land-based problem, so the, it is mostly related to mismanagement of uh, of uh, litter, so of the fact that uh, it's not uh, managed properly, and uh, so most of it is um, so the litter is dispersed in the environment in the sea because uh, it's not properly managed. So this part uh, is still you know a second part of the project, but I think it's really crucial, and this um, and these solutions that we're trying to test. Uh, uh, could also be not so expensive, could also be more uh, easily transferred. And, uh, um, and this is some, something we really should aim to, so that uh, also small islands, uh, remote islands, so solution that can be implemented also without being uh, so expensive. Uh, but that, that encourage so also people to not throw the litter in the sea just because you mm. don't see it anymore, but really to collect it and to keep it because it has a value, it has a, an economic value. Uh, and if you use it properly, you can, uh, you know, you, you can have something out of it. I think this is uh, a message that we, we need to transfer because uh, as, as it was said before, uh, to, to show that it is, that it is convenient to not, the, to not leave the litter in the, uh, in the environment. I, I think I think Fantine, if I, I come in there, and I think then Rodrigo wanted to come in as well. I think what why I get depressed about this is because the 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 best litter collection methods we've got at the moment, and even some of these vessels that are being created to go and try and uh, scoop up water, for, uh, scoop up litter from these um, oceanic gyres, the most they can do is probably. Um, uh, hectares per day or, or maybe even square kilometers a day but but these are these gyres are now millions of square kilometers and they're, they're huge and and I, I think no matter what device we we would get um and also we have to have the energy to power those but this is why your your uh, solar powered collection is, is is really good but um the best collection methods could never tackle those and then at the so that's at the sea end of it. At the land end, my my worry is that no matter we we we're not going to get people changing their clothes, uh, cleaning, changing all of our sort of artificial clothing for uh, wool and cotton, um, just because of the costs of it. And I. I, I get depressed because I don't see any end to it. I, uh, I mean, people have said, oh, we're, we, we, we could try and stop some of the litter going out, but we now do have a, um, the, the Anthropocene is a, a, well, some people have called it a Plasticine, which is the name of a child's toy, but it, a Plasticine, uh, this era of plastics. Um, the thing I said at the beginning was, I think we're probably, what we call we call preaching to the converted. I think everybody who's interested in this and everybody who's uh, m many people know that it's not a good idea to put the litter in. And in the, in webinars like this, we're reaching those people. The only problem is the people who don't care. We're not reaching those. 
you know, the, the people in some of the rivers around the, year, the, the world, especially in developing countries, are, are, are throwing their, their rubbish. It, it's their only way of getting rid of their rubbish to throw it to the nearest stream. So my worry is we're not, we're not reaching the people who are causing the problem. And it is a behavioral, it's a societal behavioral problem. But um, uh, anyway, sorry, uh, I think Rodrigo tried to speak just then, but he was he was still on. on no, we do not end this in uh, law. Uh, so Rodrigo, you want to say something? I, I want to say something before I even, I don't remember who was it, but uh, <laughs> okay. I just want to say just a couple of comments very quick. Of course, we know the best thing will be to produce less uh, plastic waste, so we pollute, uh, pollute less the marine environment and everything. But we don't actually have a clear alternative to plastics. And, and it is true. I mean, any other alternative, it will cause other environmental problems. It will be cause other kind of uh, troubles in the economy. And, and I think it's quite important to keep that. If we find alternative, as I explained in, the, in this uh, presentation, we have to think about what is causing the impact in the environment. It's actually not the little plastics. Is actually the additives that are added. That is the main cause. And the only really ecological um, effects has been observed due to additives, not to the plastic. Because we have to keep in mind that many of the experiments that we have done in the laboratory, we cannot extrapolate to the real environment. The spousal concentrations are not realistic. So of course, if we put animals in a soup of plastic, they will probably eat some plastic. Is this happening in the environment? Well, I have evidence with plankton that actually uh, zooplankton is, in, is rejecting plastic when the concentration is realistic. However, a, a copper pot can avoid the passive diffusion of contaminants, can avoid the ingestion of the plastic, but not these additives that are in the water. So all these things have to be, it's a very complex, but we have to be careful when extrapolating data from the lab and also identifying what is the main problem and how we can find an alternative when we talk about plastic. And the most clear thing. Okay, I think we, so I think we need another uh, webinar. Maybe another day. Or, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Next, no, no, because uh, I, I don't really want to end this with a, you know, in a, a bad note. I think, yeah, there is a lot of challenges, but I think we are working on the solution. This has to be, of course, we still have to understand a little bit, like you showed, uh, as I gave an example. But I think what we need is to um, work on the solutions, like uh, there was here some examples uh, uh, presented by Fantina, but there are others. And of course, the, yeah, and we need to reach for all, we cannot say that only those some countries are the problem. Some countries, of course, are still more the problem, but we all have really to find solutions also for changing the behavior of people. And of course, this economic uh, question also, Fantina and Michael saying, you know, putting value in the trash, this can be, well, this is a proven, um, a proven method that we have people that, uh, hand over the the bottles and everything because uh, they they have incentives and mm -hmm. so this we need to work also on those models this is uh, all kinds of methods to really avoid and of course uh, although um, we are working more in maelstrom in uh, in devices for 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 rivers and and, and for lagoons the rivers are the main source so if we can really stop it there, because of course, mm -hmm. if you cannot avoid plastic, we should avoid the plastic to get into the ocean. So yeah. get appropriate places and ways to, 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 to recycle it or reuse it or whatever, but not let it uh, really go to the ocean because it's true. After it's there in tons and tons and tons really, the, the, it's so difficult and the deep wow. sea to go there and get it that most of it, yeah. there is no, no, no way. But if we stop it, I think we, we can still have an ocean that probably can re regenerate and really uh, 
mm. work with the plastic that is already there. Yeah. So, is it is well, uh, is well, if I could just make a, a well, I, I'll make a suggestion for your project. Um, okay. I, I, I presented that list of 10 things, what we call the 10 tenets. Um, I published a paper with Ankle Borker where we quickly looked at all those 10 in relation to plastics. But if anyone in your project has got um, a, 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 a master student or a, a student who wants to rigorously look at the solutions to it, um, it would be interesting to work with them and just get them to go through those 10 different things um, ju just, just to um, see, see the options. So um, if anyone out there has got a spare um, master student uh, who wants to tackle this, then um, uh, yes, take it into your project and let me know. Okay, well, that's a deal. Uh, we, we are contacting you with lots of master students because we have a lot of participants here. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This was a very, uh, well, unfortunately we did not have all the time we, we wanted for this discussion. But uh, as I said, there will be other uh, opportunities in the future. So I just wanted to thank very, very much to, to all of you for your contributions that were great. And I also would like to thank, to thank of course, the Air Center and, uh, and the MBON um, for this, uh, for uh, helping us with this uh, webinar and uh, and well and then we'll keep in touch and we'll keep finding trying to find solutions I think we have a here this is a group we are, are already in touch with many actually several of you showed projects they are working on they are tackling this issue and that's that's how, that's what we can do. I mean, continue and then, of course, um, uh, raising the awareness of all the people that can make a difference. Okay, so thank you also for all our participants and well, stay tuned for the next Networking Friday and uh, have a, a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.